Hi everyone, I am Matt from CeramicMaterialsWorkshop.com and I'm here today with a video in our series, Everything You Want to Know About Clay and Glazes But Didn't Know Who to Ask. And today's question is, why are cone temperatures random? So if you're involved in ceramics, you've probably come across these before. We call them cones or pyrometric cones. And they are how we generally monitor the temperature inside of our kiln. And they work very well, they're fairly accurate, and they're very cheap. And that's very important because as you know, ceramics is an expensive habit. And the way they function is pretty simple. We have a series of cones, each cone representing a different temperature. We put them together in a cone pack and put that in the kiln. As the kiln gets to a specific temperature, the cone begins to bend, indicating that we have achieved that temperature. As the temperature continues to climb, that cone melts away, and then the next cone continues to bend, so on and so forth, until we get to our final firing temperature and we shut off the kiln. And cones work great. They're simple and easy, and they make sense. But there's something really confusing when you look at the cones themselves, and that is the temperatures that they represent are completely and utterly random. So this is a cone chart, and it's a big chart full of numbers, and we're going to try to simplify things just a little bit. First, we need to look at all of these numbers, and we're going to focus on this one column here primarily. And all of these different columns represent different heating rates, meaning how fast you go for the last 100 degrees C of the firing. And we're going to follow the 150 degrees C self-supporting cone column. So the kiln, the cone chart is actually much larger than most people realize, and it actually goes all the way from cone O22, which is 590C, all the way up here to cone 42, which is the answer to life, the universe, and everything, but it's also the last actual cone at 2015C, which is exceptionally hot. Okay, most of the time in ceramics, we tend to work at cone 10. That's actually our standard working temperature. Um, and at cone 10, we're at 1305C, which is, we consider high temperature. But as you can see, there are temperatures that are over 710 degrees hotter than that cone. Um, so, so there are a lot more cones that we don't use every day. For us, generally, cone 10 plus or minus a few cones is about our peak that our kilns can go. So we come back to the question of looking at these temperatures. Well, as I said, cone 10 is 1305. But if we go back and look at the other columns, the different heating rates, we get 1285 and 1251. And what these are saying is that if you fire slower, you can actually fire to a lower temperature and achieve the same temperature effect. But that doesn't answer the question as to why these temperatures are random. Those lower temperatures are still kind of random. Well, maybe it's a question of being anchored to a specific temperature set. So let's look at some of our other temperatures. So as we said, cone 10 is 1305, but we also tend to work at cone 6. Well, cone 6 is 1243C. That's even more random and bizarre. Well, maybe it has to do with cone 04, which is our low temperature, and that is 1077C. That, that's even more confusing. Again, leading to this notion of the temperatures being completely random. Well, maybe the actual spacing has to do with the distance between cones. So if we come up between cone 8 and 9 near the top, there's a 9 degree difference between cone 8 and cone 9. That's again sort of a random number to have as 9. Well, let's look at cone 9 to 10. That goes from 1280 to 1305. That's still, that's a 25 degree difference. That's a massive difference from 8 to 9. And it's just even more confusing. So I'm an American and we tend to work in Fahrenheit. Well, maybe the question then becomes one of Fahrenheit versus Celsius, the rest of the world tending to work in Celsius. And actually in ceramics, I think Celsius is a slightly better system. But when we take a cone chart and we look at Fahrenheit, cone 10 is 2381 and cone 6 is 2269 and cone 04 is 1971. That's even worse. That makes even less sense. So we have to continue to ask the question. But to go forward, we have to go back in the history. And we have to wonder, historically, how did we measure temperature? Because cones are not that old. In fact, they were invented in 1886, and we know that date very specifically. Um, 
Today, we also have things like pyrometers, which are cool little devices where you put the probe into your kiln and it gives you a digital readout of the temperature. And, and they work okay. Sometimes they're a little bit weird, but for the most part, they work. But those are even newer than cones. So again, how, how were they monitoring temperature before 1886? And the answer is the color of the flame. Um, if you've ever heard people use the term red hot or white hot, they're literally talking about how hot the flame is based on the color it's giving off. Uh, over here on this side, we've got a, a chart documenting how hot the color of a flame is reference to its temperature. So if you're saying red hot, well, you're really saying, oh, that's somewhere between 800 and 900 C, but it depends on your reference of red. Are you talking maroon or are you talking crimson or are you talking scarlet? And, and as we get hotter, we go into orange and yellow and eventually white at 1300. And the way that they looked at this temperature is literally the kiln master would look inside a kiln, like in this picture, and they'd say, yeah, that's pretty yellow, I guess. So I'm going to say it's between 1,000 and 1,100. I can't say specifically because I'm just guessing. All I really know is that I want this kiln to be white because I need to fire to cone 10 to get my pots done. And luckily, 1,300 is white hot. And the guesstimating actually worked pretty well, but it wasn't good for the eyes because looking into a kiln without any eye protection is sort of kind of exceptionally dangerous um, and could really, really blind you if you do it for enough years. Um, although the odd irony is actually looking at the temperature of the color of to reference temperature is very accurate. To this day, the most accurate way to measure temperature in a kiln is with a piece of equipment called an optical pyrometer. And this equipment actually looks at the wavelength of the light that is given off by the kiln and then creates a reference temperature. And they're exceptionally accurate. They're just very expensive and very rare, so no one really uses them. So we have to come back to the question of the cones. And to talk about cones, we have to talk about this gentleman, Herman Seeger. And he lived from 1839 to 1893. And he is my absolute man crush in ceramics. And it's not just the original hipster beard. He was a genius. And the name Seeger is still associated with ceramics to this day. In much of the world, the name cones is still associated with Seeger cones. In the United States, we call them Orton cones, and that's just because the company that manufactures them is named Orton. But what Seeger did that was so important is he developed something called the Unity Molecular Formula, the UMF. And he developed this system as a method to monitor temperature inside the kiln by referencing the chemistry of our glazes. And actually, in the future, ceramicists took this UMF system and we used it as a way to be able to look at glaze chemistry without ever mixing a glaze or firing glaze. We're able to predict how glazes are going to perform based on looking at their chemistry. And it's an amazing system. But that's another talk for another day. So in 1896, Seeger published his paper, Pyrometers in the Measurement of High Temperatures with Standard Cones. And the thing that Seeger understood that was so revolutionary is that glazes and glasses are chemistry. Now this is a bit of a controversial subject because in art, we like to believe that our artistic intention overcomes the chemistry of the materials. And the fact is that that's just not true, okay? We still have to look at chemistry in everything. The ocean might be this amazing, beautiful place, but it's still just a bunch of H2O molecules. And we can use our artistic intention and manipulate chemistry to communicate through our ceramics, but we're still utilizing the chemistry every single time we turn on the kiln. So Seeger understood that glasses had a chemical system, and if he could document it, he could use that to his advantage. So he came up with a system where he looked at glaze compositions as a relationship between the chemicals themselves and heat which is massively important. Now, before we go any farther, I need to give everybody some terrible flashbacks to high school and traumatize you with this beautiful document. This is the periodic table of the elements. And this is an even more beautiful version because this is a ceramics dedicated version, indicating all of the ceramic behavior of the individual elements. But we're not gonna go over the whole thing. I just wanna talk about a few specific elements. And we're gonna start over here with two. 
uh, elements, and these are aluminum and silicon. And these are our glass formers, meaning they literally make up the glass that we look at when we're looking at our glazes. And we actually don't quite use the words aluminum and silicon. You may have heard the terms alumina and silica. And that's because we bond them with oxygen to make the other glass former forms. Okay, so alumina and silica are making up the actual glass. The problem is alumina and silica have exceptionally high melting temperatures on their own. So we need to use materials called fluxes to bring down that melting temperature. And the fluxes are over here. And these are lithium, sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, and barium. And very simply, we're just using them to bring down that melting temperature. Now they play some other roles in the effects of texture and color, but really we're using them to bring down the melting temperature. And that's because in our glazes, we have to deal with a lot of silica and alumina. In fact, about 80% of your glaze is going to be silica and alumina, and of that, it's about 70% silica. We're really just using alumina to stiffen up our glass and to keep it from running off the pot because melted silica tends to flow. Um, so we're really just using a lot of silica and alumina. But the problem with those is, again, their melting temperature is exceptionally high. Silica's natural melting temperature without any fluxes is 1710C, which is around cone 32. Again, these are real cones at cone 32. Alumina is even more of a problem because alumina's melting temperature is 2072C, and that's over cone 42, which was our last cone. And just for reference how hot this is, I also teach at Alfred University, which has an amazing ceramic engineering department. The hottest kiln at Alfred University only goes to 1850C. So it's hot enough to melt silica without any fluxes, but won't even melt alumina. So alumina absolutely must have fluxes. All of these systems must have fluxes to get down to 1300, because that's about as far as we can push the kilns that we use. Again, and that comes down to kiln design and cost effectiveness and technology. Um, it's also the natural working temperature of our materials. Again, that's another talk for another time. So Seeger understood these concepts that we had to bring the melting temperature down. And he also understood that as we add more flux in proportion to the glass formers, the temperature came farther and farther down, which meant there is a proportional relationship between our chemistry and firing temperature. He also understood something rather important. No one is really working at these high temperatures unless you're in high tech, but most ceramics to that day and to this day are really sort of in that cone 10, cone 6 range. So what he thought is, well, why don't we measure from pure fluxes and start adding silicon alumina? So we move from the bottom up. And the way that he came up with it is a rather ingenious system. And the, what I like to think about for the unity molecular formula is we have to consider our fluxes in proportion. And I like to think about one gallon of gas. Now, as I said, I'm an American, so we talk about gallons of gas and not liters of petrol, but the concept is the same. One gallon of gas has exactly 114,000 BTUs, or British thermal units, and that's a set amount of potential energy. And what we can do is we can use that potential energy to different ends. One example is we can make a smart car, which is a very small, very light car. It doesn't have a lot of material to move in itself. So because of that, we get much greater fuel efficiency. You can get about 40 miles per gallon. Okay, so that with that 114,000 BTUs. But if you drive a big giant pickup truck, you're much heavier. There's a lot more metal and plastic uh, and, and tires and all that sort of stuff. And so you get much lower fuel efficiency because you're using more energy just to move the heavier mass. So that big giant truck is going to get about 13 miles per gallon. So the smaller car goes farther on the same gas because there's less material to move. And our glazes are exactly the same. If you have more silicon alumina, more material to move, they inherently melt at a higher firing temperature. If there's a less material, it fires at a lower temperature. And that is incredible because what Seeger did is he harnessed that concept and put it into our cones. And what the cones have is that every single cone, doesn't matter what temperature, has the equivalent of one gallon of gas. It has what we would say is one mole of fluxes. So this cone and this cone and this cone and this cone, although they fire to different temperatures, have exactly the same amount of flux in them. And what they have that's different is more silicon alumina, which inherently reflects a higher temperature. And this is all done in moles, which is just the system we use in chemistry to put molecules in proportion to each other. And we'll talk about this more in other lectures. So 
For the cones, as we add silicon alumina while keeping the fluxes the same, the temperature goes up. And this is actually the system that he developed. These are, this is the actual chemistry of his cones. So what we've got here is the cones, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And we've got some of our materials. We've got potassium and calcium, which are two of those fluxes. And we've got alumina and silica. We're just going to skip over iron for this talk. But let's look at cone 5. In cone 5, we've got 0.3 moles of potassium. And we have 0.7 moles of, of calcium. We have 0.5 moles of alumina, and we have 5 moles of silica. Shockingly enough, 0.5 and 5 equal cone 5. Let's go to cone 6. We again have 0.3 to 0.7 equaling 1 mole of fluxes, or 1 gallon of gas. Our alumina level then goes up to 0.6, and our silica level is 6. Shockingly enough, that's cone 6. Cone 7, exactly the same. 0.3 to 0.7, 1 mole of fluxes, 1 gallon of gas. 0.7 alumina, 7 silica. Are you seeing the trend? Let's jump to cone 10. 1 mole of fluxes. Uh, uh, we all then have 1 mole of alumina and 10 moles of silica. So we are incrementally increasing every cone we go. We're adding 0.1 moles of alumina and 1 mole of silica. Upward and onward, and the temperature climbs. Now, as we get over cone 10, the amounts of silicon alumina jump. They're not quite as smooth and consistent, but the principle is exactly the same. We increase silicon alumina in a systematic manner, and the temperature goes up. So back to the question, why are cone temperatures random? Well, it comes down to the chemistry. By placing our glass formers in proportion to our fluxes on a molecular scale, as we increase the amount of glass formers in proportion to the fluxes, the melting temperature goes up meaning that cone temperatures are random because they reflect specific compositions and not specific temperatures, which is exceptionally important when it comes to glazes. Because if we can control the melting temperature in a cone, we can do the same to glazes. And that's the entire principle behind the unity molecular formula. And we can also do a lot, lot more, like texture, crazing, fixing glaze flaws, fixing durability. It's all there hidden in the UMF, but that's another story for another time. And if you'd like to learn that story, I encourage you to come over to ceramicmaterialsworkshop.com and to take our first online workshop, Glazed and Confused, Understanding the UMF. Because in just a few hours, we will change your studio forever. You'll begin to understand how your glazes work and gain the ability to take control of them and work with them and become uh, the master of your glazes. And it's available now at ceramicmaterialsworkshop.com for only $10. And if you're new to ceramics, coming soon, we're going to have our second lecture, Glaze of Our Lives, Understanding Glazes for the Absolute Beginner. So please come to ceramicmaterialsworkshop.com. It's a place online to learn and discuss about ceramic materials firing and process. If you don't know where to begin, if books have left you high and dry, if you're working by yourself or you're working at a school and things just aren't getting explained very well, if you want to understand why firing temperatures work, why cone 10, why cone 6, why cone 04, if you want to know more about the safety and durability of your glazes, if you just want to have the coolest glazes on the block, or if you need to know more about what you're doing, come to ceramicmaterialsworkshop.com. Now, if you have a question you'd like for me to answer in one of this, the video series, everything you want to know about clay and glazes, but didn't know who to ask, you can email me at matt at ceramicmaterialsworkshop.com. And please consider supporting us on Patreon or PayPal to help keeping all this information coming. So thanks for your time, and I hope to see you over at ceramicmaterialsworkshop.com.